Welcome to Stanford Med Story, a new series where we cover a new medical concept and the research being done here at Stanford Department of Medicine to solve some of the world's biggest health challenges. I'm your host, Rebecca Handler, and today we'll be talking with Dr. Olivier Givart, who's working on cancer diagnostics using AI technology. Today we're gonna to talk about a new tool that you have in development called Sequoia. But to start, I'm wondering if we could really talk about cancer diagnosis as it is right now. What does that look like? Typically a piece of tissue from a biopsy or maybe from surgery is analyzed by the pathologist. They put a piece of tissue on a glass slide and they look at it under a microscope. And they use this kind of staining, which is hematoxylin and eosin staining, mm -hmm. to look at the cells and the tissues. And this is what is called a whole slide image. And they use this to determine the stage or the grade of the tumor. Mm -hmm. And that essentially determines subsequent treatment of the patient. So that's kind of, kind of like one part of the workflow of how a cancer patient is diagnosed. And does that involve RNA sequencing and looking at the genomic sequencing of the biopsy of the Genomic tumor? sequencing is more and more being used. It's when we use RNA sequencing for cancer patients, we essentially get a snapshot of all the different processes and pathways that are active in a tumor or in a cancer sample. And that gives us a lot of information about these processes that you're mm -hmm. talking about, inflammation, hypoxia, other types of processes that are relevant for cancer patients. And that can give insights in terms of what drugs to use, but could mm -hmm. also give insight in drug discovery. Because if mm -hmm. we know what processes are active, we can also design drugs to counteract these processes. It's really a very versatile way of measuring what's going on in the cell and in the, in the tissue. Uh, and it gives us a lot of information, both diagnostic, prognostic, but also in the basic science, in terms of the basic molecular processes that are ongoing. And as of right now, as it stands, it is expensive to do mm -hmm. genomic sequencing of these samples, and it's time intensive. So what you're working on here is really innovative in the sense that that will hopefully cut down the time mm -hmm. and cut down the cost of being able to understand what is going on with a patient's tumor. Can you just describe Sequoia, what it is in simple terms, and how you're using it in cancer diagnostics right now? This model essentially looks at the image, and then we've built uh, an AI workflow that is based on a foundation model that extracts features from these images. Mm -hmm. And then using these features, we put those in what is called a transformer. This is very similar to what's done in ChatGPT. And then we can predict up to 20,000 genes, uh, their activity. So traditionally, you have a biopsy, so a tumor sample that's being taken out, and you're looking at the tissue under a microscope. So it takes a lot of time, and mm -hmm. it can be difficult. But what you are doing then is you're looking at the image, you're putting it into this software, and just like with generative AI, you're using that to make predictions. What are we actually looking at predicting through this process? What we are essentially seeing is that the image is acting as a surrogate of what's going on molecular. So I also have to admit that we were surprised how good this model worked mm. uh, and uh, in terms of how many genes we can actually predict from the image. Wow. For example, in breast cancer, we can predict up to 15,000 genes with very high accuracy and low error. And this essentially tells us that these high resolution images are essentially hiding or that there's signals in there that mm. maybe cannot be seen by the human eye, but that a model like a machine learning model or an AI model can actually distinguish and can use for prediction. Why was breast cancer specifically chosen as one of your areas of study? So in breast cancer, there's a number of commercially available uh, assays that are mm -hmm. being used right now to determine treatment of these patients. Uh, Mama print is one of them. It's based on a number of genes. And that test is being used to determine whether uh, women would get chemotherapy or not, depending mm. on their risk of recurrence. Mm -hmm. And breast cancer is really one of the main examples right now in, in the clinic where these assays are being used. So we wanted to show that using Sequoia and uh, the digital prediction of these genes without doing the, uh, the actual assay can essentially mimic that assay. And then we can only use the, the AI model to make the prediction instead of actually having to run the, the molecular test. So where were you pulling your samples from in order to train this model? So we are using uh, data from a lot of publicly available projects and national projects, including the Cancer Genome Atlas, funded by the National Institutes of Health and National Cancer Institute, and provided data of more than 10,000 patients. And so we use these type of data sets oh. to train the model. Do you think this technology could be applied potentially to other diseases beyond cancer? The model is actually also trained on uh, healthy tissues. So okay. we used images from healthy tissues across a number of cases. 
And the model is definitely not tied to breast cancer or cancer mm-hmm, in general. Mm-hmm. It was trained on 16 cancer tissues. We are looking to expand that. It could be used in other areas, maybe infectious diseases or other areas where digital pathology is relevant. What genetic features are you using? What's next for Sequoia? We want to expand uh, the number of uh, tissues that the model is trained on. We mm-hmm. also want to look at pediatric cancers. We think that the breast cancer use case is definitely uh, the most uh, low-hanging fruit in terms of deploying this model. Sure. We need to do the prospective studies to validate the model and show that in a head-to-head comparison, the model performs equally well as a molecular test and then seek FDA approval. So how close are we to seeing this perhaps in everyday office use? So I think maybe in a few years we could see uh, using this model in, in, in clinical practice. So the work you're doing here is just incredible. Thank you so much for joining us.